Good morning and welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you have joined us for worship this Sunday morning, either in person or online, and we trust that you will be blessed by your presence with us today. This is a season of new beginnings in our church, new Bible studies, new fellowship groups, new opportunities to worship and serve and learn. So many of those are described in the bulletin. And so if you are watching us online, just let us know if you'd like one. We'll be happy to send it to you, either electronically or on paper. This morning's Bible reading also describes a time of great new beginnings for the children of Israel. And I'll be saying much, much more about that later. But at this time, I invite you to join me in the worship of a God who strives to free us from our chains and lead us into a great new time of freedom. Amen. worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. For He Please stand and join me in the call to worship the responsive reading in the bulletin from Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on our wonderful works.
Welcome one and all. Good to see you today. So glad that you are able to join us in church. Kind of an exciting day, start of a new season, new world. And so I thought I'd tell you about another exciting memory I had. Many years ago, I used to play with wheels, really cool wheels, kind of like that one. They were called Hot Wheels. Yeah, Hot Wheels. Yeah, they moved really fast and they looked really cool. So that was one of them we used to play with, like shiny and gold. Here's another one, green. And I really loved that as a kid with the two big things sticking up, the metal parts, all those pipes. You can literally laugh at, yeah, you like that one too. And here's, oops, well, there's one more coming. I don't think that's a Hot Wheel, but somewhere there's another one coming and it's kind of fun too to watch and to see. Ooh, yeah, that one looks like a truck. Isn't that something with all those pipes? But not only did I used to play with them, my brother and I actually used to race them. Yeah, yeah, and so they had this long track that he set up in the house and he'd start up really, really high, and then he'd take it over like a chair, and then he'd take it over like an ottoman, and then he'd bring it to the ground, and we'd race and see which cars went fastest. And we had a lot of fun with that. But the reason I mentioned that to you today is, yeah, to you and all of you, is that the Bible story for today also has wheels in it. Really important wheels, but those wheels were actually on, can anyone guess? Wasn't a car. What do you think they were on? Not on your hands. They were on chariots. There's a picture of a chariot. Yeah, they used to push them with horses and pull them. They had soldiers on them. And there's lots of Bible stories that involve chariots. The scariest one of all, the serious ones were called chariots of iron. Here this iron is painted, but it was really hard. You know, you couldn't get a spear through it or anything. So it was kind of scary, especially when your enemies had chariots of iron. It's like, oh no, what do we do? I don't know, it's kind of scary. It was especially scary in the Exodus because guess who had chariots of iron? Anybody know the bad guy in Exodus? You know? You weren't the bad guy for that. <laughs> no. You were a good girl. That's her view. Are there any guesses? Pharaoh. Pharaoh was the bad guy. Yeah, the whole, the whole first part of it. And he had so many chariots. He had chariots of iron. And guess how many chariots the Hebrews had? Zero. You got it exactly right. They didn't have any chariots. So it looked like when those two groups set up the fight, looked like who was going to win? Looked like Pharaoh. That's why he's got that nasty smile on his face. Kind of not a nice guy. But, did any of you know who really did win? You win. You win. I win. Cool. The disciples. You're right, the Hebrew people are actually the ones who won the war. Even though they didn't have any chariots, all the odds were against them. God actually led them through that sea right there. It's called the Red Sea. God led them right in the middle of it. He helped them to get through. And then guess what happened to the water when the, when the Pharaoh chased them? Can you say... Good job, Cosette. That's right. Whoosh. They got washed away. So, they did. So the important thing to remember is that even in our lives, you know, sometimes it feels like the odds are against us. That sometimes it feels like we might be in really big trouble and some bad people might hurt us and do bad things. And what's really important to remember is even though we can't always see it at the time, God is still working God is still moving, and God often brings surprises to us that we did not expect. Surprises to you too, Cosette. You like surprises? Yes! Yes, you do. I like them too. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for the surprises you bring in our lives, especially in times of challenge. We pray, God, that you would help us to look for your hand in the world, to trust your promises, and to follow as you lead. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Say amen again. Amen. Good job. Thank you all for coming down. Have a good day. We'll see you later.
Our Lord Jesus Christ understands our weaknesses. In every respect, he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may find God's mercy and grace. If you'd stand and join me in the prayer of confession, let us confess our sins to our almighty God. Gracious and holy God, we thank you today those who dare to step up when there are people looking down. Those who dare to step out when there could be no safe return. Those who dare to be faithful, even when his choice us more. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we have failed to follow them, and help us in your mercy to pursue the strength that you share. For we ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The past is left behind. Everything has become fresh and new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Good morning. We are so glad to... Lift our praises up on a beautiful day. Shaddai 
One reason we can praise God in our congregation is the things that God is doing in our lives and in our world. I've already mentioned some of them at the beginning of church today. I've got to highlight just a few others. If you're interested in getting involved in a new Bible study, one starting just this Wednesday here at the church, 12.30 p.m. I know Kim and Ann would love to see you there. If you would like sort of an overview of the church or perhaps a refresher of the gospel, uh, then this coming Saturday at 9 a.m., we're going to have a brunch here. We'd love for you to join us. It's called Discovering Grace, and we hope indeed that you might wish to be a part of that and discover something new and fresh in your life as well. Coming in October, we're going to be having small group dinners once again, dinners for eight or dinners with friends. You can be signing up for that soon. And uh, those of you who are interested in community service work, we're going to have another packing party on Saturday the 25th at 1.30 p.m. The purpose is to pack shoeboxes for needy children overseas, Christmas gifts, school supplies, all that sort of thing, and we would love for you to be a part of that as well. We've gone to prayer concerns. We hope you'll remember each person whose name is listed in our bulletin. We hope you'll remember students and teachers on the cusp of a brand new year. We hope you remember healthcare workers, once again, strained by COVID-19. We hope you remember the many refugees from war and oppression, and also those recovering from earthquakes, fires, and floods throughout the world. And finally, on this weekend, a very poignant weekend overall, we hope that you will intercede for those who are still grieving 9-11 in a very personal sort of way. And in honor of those individuals, we have a clip now to share with you. On September 11th, 2001, the course of American history was suddenly changed. We remember the chaos and the confusion, the destruction and the heartbreak the shock of 3,000 lives lost in a single day. But we also remember the great resolve of everyday people, the acts of heroism that brought us together, the men and women who stood in the gap, 
somehow still fighting, giving every ounce of strength to help others. Decades have passed since that historic day. And in that time, we have learned that despite all the suffering and loss, our God remains faithful. Even when smoke and debris obscure our paths, His unfailing love will carry us through. As we remember those who were lost, let us honor their memory with our lives, giving our own strength to help the hurting, making sacrifices for those around us, and sharing the faith which brings eternal hope and peace. This is our promise and our prayer for 9-11. In that sentiment, let us pray. God, we are so grateful for your presence with us. Even in times of tragedy, even when hope is lost, even when buildings fall, your word is firm, your presence is sure, your guidance is clear. So help us, God, to listen. Help us to believe. Help us to obey. So that the light of hope and grace might shine brightly once again, especially in the lives of those who suffer most. But we do ask it and all things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
like the anthem you just heard this morning, the Bible text describes a scene of deliverance when God moved very powerfully in history. If you've been with us for the last three weeks, you know that this is the climax, the ultimate demonstration of God's sovereignty and power, a power that was displayed a bit more subtly before. Unfortunately, Pharaoh was not a person who cared for subtlety. Gnats, frogs, flies, fleas, eh, who cares? Nor did Pharaoh care enough for the devastating plagues that wiped out flocks and fields. Yes, he asked God for relief, but when relief came, Pharaoh reneged on his promise to set the people free. And that leads us through the last plague, into this morning's text. At midnight, Yahweh struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who was sitting on the throne, to the firstborn of each prisoner in the dungeon, and the firstborn of each domestic animal. Pharaoh got up with all his servants and all the people of Egypt uttering a gut-wrenching cry, for there was not a single home without someone who had died. The key word here is gut-wrenching. It's ak gadol in Hebrew. A gut-wrenching cry. This is actually the fulfillment of a prophecy that God gave in chapter 5 of verse 11, and it was grim. Then Pharaoh called out to Aaron and Moses in the middle of the night, saying, Get up and get out from the midst of my people, both you and the children of Israel. Go and serve Yahweh, as you said. Take also the flocks and herds, as you said, and please bless me. Such a fascinating paragraph. The first sentence is both angry and intense. Get up. Get out. Pretty understandable, given what happened just before. The second sentence, I suspect, had the same tone. Oh, sure, take them. Flocks and herds, adults and kids, women and men, take them. Thus conceding everything Pharaoh tried to negotiate before. But the most amazing sentence is the last one. Bless me. Please bless me. In those days, blessing was not just saying something nice. Blessing was a means of bestowing benevolent power. So in this passage, once again, Pharaoh talks like a believer. Just as he had earlier asked for God's forgiveness, now he asked for God's blessing. If that attitude had continued, the story might have ended differently. So the children of Israel left. They set from Sukkoth and camped at Etham, on the edge of the wilderness. Yahweh went up before them, leading them through a pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night. This enabled them to travel day or night. This paragraph has the first reference in Exodus to a very important object, what the rabbis called the Shekinah, God's manifest presence. Near the end of Exodus, it will rest above the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. Here, it is manifested in a traveling pillar of cloud and fire. Cloud imagery will be really important later in faith history. 
Ezekiel will see God departing the temple of Israel in a cloud when they are sent off to Babylon. And the New Testament tells us in Matthew's gospel that Jesus will appear in clouds of glory at the end of time. But in this morning's text, probably the fire imagery is most important. This is the second of three big scenes in Exodus involving fire. The first is the burning bush where Moses first encounters God. The third is at Mount Sinai where he receives the Ten Commandments. And this is the second one, both for Moses and all the people. This fire is an important symbol of God's presence and power. It also enables God's people to see in the middle of the night, thus continuing the light-dark imagery we talked about last week. But when the king of Egypt heard that the Hebrews fled, Pharaoh and his servants changed their minds again, saying, What in the world have we done? Why did we release these Israelites from serving us? Then he prepared his own chariot and his army too. They took 600 of the very best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, to pursue the Israelites, who were marching out boldly, for God had hardened Pharaoh's heart. The key word here is chariot, Rekeb in Hebrew, because that was the most advanced implement of war back in Pharaoh's day. Could do a whole sermon just on that word. In this morning's text, the Hebrews had no chariots or horses either. Pharaoh had 600 first-class chariots and some second-class ones as well, along with horses and riders to go with them. So the people were at a great disadvantage. And it would not be the last time. In the second book of Samuel, David would defeat 700 charioteers from the nation of Aram. And in the book of Judges, Queen Deborah, a female general, would defeat 900 charioteers from the land of Canaan. Both times they were outnumbered. Both times they still prevailed. That's why in the book of Deuteronomy, God says, do not be afraid of chariots or armies in war. I'll be with you. And that's why the psalmist declares, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the Lord our God. Say more about that one soon. At this point, the angel of God who had been traveling before the Israelites, moved to the rear of their encampment. The pillar of cloud also moved back into the rear. This cloud separated the Egyptians from the Israelites throughout the evening, bringing darkness to one side and light to the other. Notice the light-dark thing again. Then Moses stretched out his hand above the sea, and Yahweh sent a fierce east wind upon it. The wind cleaved the waters, and the sea became like dry ground. Notice the wind doesn't blow the waters away. Interestingly enough, it heaps them up. But it's not too fierce to blow either the Hebrews or the Egyptians away. It's almost like they're walking through the eye of a hurricane. They're surrounded by devastation, and yet, for them, the winds are calm. So the children of Israel walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground, passing between two walls of water, one on the right and one on the left. But the Egyptians went in after them, pursuing them with Pharaoh's horses and his chariots into the middle of the sea. In the last watch of the night, Yahweh looked down upon the Egyptians from the pillar of cloud and fire. Then he threw their whole army into a panic. He made their wheels swerve, so the chariots were very hard to drive. At this, the Egyptians said, Yahweh is fighting for them against us. Let us flee. In addition to using natural forces, notice Yahweh's having a bit of fun in this text with chariots. Fun that will continue in other parts of the Bible. Yes, they might be fearsome instruments of war. They might be had great riders and horses too. 
But their skills are no match for God. So Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out your hand once again upon the sea, and the waters will flow back on the Egyptians, their chariots, and their horsemen. Moses did so. When dawn came, the water level was back to normal, and God had swept all the Egyptians who pursued the Israelites into the middle of the sea. Its waters submerged both the chariots and the horsemen. Not a single one of them remained. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song unto the Lord. I will sing unto the Lord, for he's arisen gloriously, both horse and rider thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, for he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will adore him, the God of my fathers, and I will exalt him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The very last paragraph we read contains a truly full-throated and exultant declaration of faith. It starts with the word arisen. He's arisen gloriously. In Hebrew, that word's an infinitive absolute. It's sort of like bold-faced, underlined. It has a kick. They want you to notice it and see. In this text, it means that God has arisen much, much higher than all the forces arrayed against him. He's risen up like a wave above their enemies. In other words, all those chariots are nothing compared to God. That affirmation continues in the next slide with four tremendous claims. First, God is my strength and song. That word strength often refers to towers and rocks. Now it's within the people and their leader. Second, he's become my salvation. You know, do any of you remember the Hebrew word for that? Salvation? Yeshua, from which we get the word Jesus, our Savior. Third, he's my God. My God, I will adore him. The Hebrew word adore means to gaze ardently. It's something almost like a groom does at a bride. There's so much affection there. And fourth, Moses declares along with the people, he's the God of my ancestors and I will exalt him. Exalt means to make more evident, more clear. Here in church, when we lift up our voices, we lift up our hands, we lift up our offering each Sunday, we're doing that to exalt God, to make him more evident in the community and the world. Just as God himself rose up from the waves to defeat the people's enemies, so they raise up their voices to exalt his name in Israel. And then throughout the world. But what does it mean for us, for you and me today? Well, first, I think we have to acknowledge that it's very easy to exalt God in our days of triumph. You got the new job or the promotion. Your team won the pennant or the championship. Perhaps you won the heart of that very special gal or guy, made a new commitment to that person. Perhaps you launched your last kid off to college in a new career. Hallelujah! <laughs> Empty nest sounds really good. Robert Browning describes this feeling in a very famous poem. The years at the spring, the days at the morn, the larks on the wing, the snails on the thorn. Mornings at seven, the hillsides dew peeled. God's in his heaven. And all's right with the world. Sometimes our world is like that. God's in his heaven, all's right with the world. It's easy to exalt him on those days. But it's actually crucial to exalt him in our moments of defeat. When you lost the job, when you didn't get the promotion, when the exciting romance faltered, when your team or business failed, that's because this exaltation helps us to reframe it. 
helps us put our current experience in perspective. Jewish people understood that intimately and personally because they lived it for centuries. Ups and downs, ins and outs, victories and defeats. Before this morning's text, the Bible says they lived in slavery for 150 years. That's a long time. Then after this morning's passage, there would be contests, many contests, for sovereignty within the promised land. When they faced those contests, when they wondered who to trust, the rabbis directed them back to this passage, to this morning's text, so they could remember who God is, how God works within the world. The reason we can exalt him, even in our struggles, is because of how God works. And I think three traits are really clear in this text. First, God is able to upend injustice. In Egypt and everywhere else, God does not like oppression. He does not like injustice. He does not like abuse. In this morning's text, God literally moves heaven and earth to change it, to set his people free. In other times, it's not quite so obvious. It might take years or decades or even centuries, but it's important for us to know God is a force of freedom. That's how he works. That's who he is. I was reminded of that just a while back when recalling a wedding I did here, an interracial wedding between a couple that are very active in our church. They're such dear people. Didn't even think about the racial aspect. Really, I just thought about who they were, how they loved each other, how they served within the church. It was really, really sweet. But then... About a year after that, I realized that in the state where I grew up and in the time when I grew up, that would have been a crime. Until 1967, that sort of marriage was a crime in 17 states. That changed because of a very persistent Jewish lawyer and a very persistent Christian couple who insisted on going back to their home state as a couple. Finally, those laws were overturned. And not long after that, interestingly enough, Martin Luther King gave his famous speech saying, based on that experience and others, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. It bends toward justice because God wants to overturn it. That's who God is, both in the world and in this morning's text. The second thing we must remember is that God is faithful to his word. In the early part of Exodus, it says God responds as he does in this book, not just because of the groaning of his people that does upset him, but also because of his promises to their ancestors. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, promises God made 400 years before are still effective, they're still powerful, they're still active, they still bring about dramatic change in this text. After this morning's passage, God made several other promises. Promises we must cherish and must keep. Perhaps the most famous one comes from John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, key word, whoever, ever shall not perish but have eternal life. 
And so the other very powerful words come straight from the lips of Jesus. I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and they know me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me bear much fruit. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Those who live and believe in me shall never die. You might say, I staked my life on that promise. And to some extent, so have you. God is faithful to his word. The third thing we must remember from this morning's text is that God's ultimate goal is peace. Now, that may seem ironic after all the deaths recorded in this passage, but it's important to remember that the Egyptians were not killed by those huge walls of water through which the Hebrews passed. The Egyptians were killed by chasing down the Hebrews between those walls of water that God allows them to collapse. So it's not the miracle that kills them, actually. It's the end of the miracle, the return to normal, the return to balance, the return to a planet that was ordered as God intended it to be, with good and healthy boundaries for earth and sky and sea. That's why there is no bloodshed here. There's just a wave of peace Jesus picks up that theme on the night he was betrayed, knowing how bad the very next day would be. He chooses to comfort his disciples with these words, I have said these things so that you might have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. But have no fear, for I have overcome the world. The bottom line, my friends, is simply this. Each of us will know some days of glorious victory in this life. And each of us will know some long days of defeat. But even on those hard days, especially in those hard days, you can find hope. If you remember how this God works, both in Scripture and in the world today, Moses says it clearly in this morning's text. The Lord is my strength. He's become my salvation. He's my God. I'll adore him. The God of my fathers. And I will. Exalt him. With those words in mind, let us pray. Dear God, there are some times in life when we feel outgunned. The force of Pharaoh is just too intimidating, too mighty, and too great. Especially in those moments of discouragement. Help us, Lord, to remember you. Then help us, God, to act on the promises that you give so we too might find peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Hear the good news of the gospel. Wherever you go, God goes with you. Wherever you are, God is already there. The same God who dwells in you has something he wants to do through you where you are. So go forth with God's blessing to bless the lives of others, remembering that Christ walks with you. Amen. Thank you.